who need Jesus, amen, who need to touch those who need God's presence in their life, amen. We all have family members, amen, that need, need a touch of God. It doesn't even matter how good a family is, uh, what, we, what the world defines as good. Without Jesus, amen, we're, we're empty, amen. Right. So I want to pray for our families, that God will just touch them, that God will use our lives to bring salvation to them. Amen. I want to pray for the surrounding churches, Riverside Rialto, San Bernardino, Pastor Rudy, Sister Amanda, Pastor Peter, and Sister Jeslyn, and Pastor Robert, and Sister Gabby. Um, Pastor Robert's daughter, she's doing better. Amen. Amen. They got the infection. Seems like it's getting under control. Yeah. Amen. It was scary. Amen. She had an infection. It was the same infection Pastor Sean had when, when, when the Lord took him. So you know what? God, you know, God is doing a miracle there. Amen. Amen. So I want to thank God for that. And, uh, I want to continue praying for the churches throughout the fellowship, amen, for for continued revival as we come off of our conference, amen. and for the churches in Mexico, South America, we always want to keep Peru <coughs> and Colombia in our prayers, amen, those are churches that we're directly connected to. Uh, we're probably going to be purchasing the flags real soon, now that we have wall space for them, um, so we're going to be purchasing the flags as soon as we start hanging all the flags that we have. We have a direct contact with for each country. Amen. So we want to pray for these countries, Italy, France, Peru, Colombia, Mexico. Man, that God will continue to help us. Amen. 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 Uh, I also want to pray for Pastor Raymond Reddy. He, he flies back to Fiji uh, today. He gets a direct flight out of LA. Just to give you an idea. He's leaving today. It's Sunday. And it's like a 12, 13 hour flight. He'll get there on Tuesday. Amen. Because he loses an entire day because where Fiji is, it's the beginning of the time time frame of the world. It's the it's the first hour of, of the clock. So you'll get there to, you'll get there Tuesday. He loses Monday. Amen. But it's okay, he gained a day when he came over here. So it's a give and take. Hallelujah. So it's what I pray for traveling mercies for him, amen. He's the last of those that are traveling back from conference from, from last week. Amen. So you know what this morning you can trust in God. You know, there's a lot of things we go through, a lot of things we need pro we have problems with. Sometimes there's emotional problems, sometimes there's financial problems, spiritual problems, sometimes our kids are unruly, sometimes our relationships, our marriages are a problem. But you know what? The God we serve is capable of taking care of all these things. Amen. Trust in God this morning and allow God, amen, to 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 bless you this morning. So let's bow our hearts, amen. Let's worship God as we open up a prayer. Let's worship God. Father, we thank you, God, this morning, God, for this time and opportunity, God. God, I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that you just speak to our hearts, God. God, meet the needs of your people, God. God, I pray, God, that you just touch people, God. Open up our hearts, God, that your word may penetrate, God, this morning. God, that lives will be changed, God. And God, that we may serve you, God, wholeheartedly, God. God, I pray, God, for the needs of spoken and the unspoken, God. God, for the deep within our hearts, God, I pray, God, that you just touch us right now, God. Create miracles, God, God, that everyone will know, God, that it is you. And we thank you, Lord, and just let me pray. Amen. Amen. You take time to greet someone. Amen. She runs when there's bears too. And jumps. 
Amen. Amen. We're going to, uh, we got some announcements. We're going to continue, amen. Uh, we're going to remind you of our regular services every Sunday morning at 10, every Wednesday at 7. Amen. Um, uh, don't forget, we have our events every first and third Sunday of the month. Amen. Our Sunday night fight. Amen. We're going to be, uh, uh, San Bernardino is doing the same thing. They're, they're bringing back their Sunday nights. There may be Sundays where we where we uh, where we come together with the San Martino Church, Amen. But uh, <clears throat> but that's the first and third Sunday of each month. We just had our last one uh, this past Sunday. A good time with the pastors from Guadalajara, <coughs> Amen. Here's a schedule, Amen, that we have. So this is the Inland Empire schedule. This is stuff that we have as as New Destiny Inland Empire. This is an important schedule, you guys. This is a very important schedule. Your street, the street invasion dates are on your left, and the corporate services are on your right. So our for our next street invasion will be May 4th in San Bernardino. It is a Saturday. I'll let you know the time. But that's coming up on May the 4th in San Bernardino. And all the churches are coming together for this. We're all gonna be there and uh and it's gonna be a really good time. We're gonna go reach the lost. We're gonna we're gonna let people know about Jesus. It's gonna be a powerful time in God. Amen. So the dates on your left, May 4th, San Bernardino, June the 8th will be Rialto. And then the corporate services the next day on May 5th. Yes, on Cinco de Mayo. Amen. We are going to the, have a service in Riverside. It's a corporate service. These are corporate events. Meaning the service, the, the, the churches within our fellowship in the local area, we're all coming together in unity as one. You know how the past few weekends we've had a, we've had about 50, 60 people in this building? Because they've all come to support us. This is our turn to return and show gratitude to them. And we're going to we're gonna go to their church and show support to the corporate service that they're going to have. Amen. So May 5th. Make yourself available. I give everybody plenty of time, amen, to make arrangements so you can be there. It's going to be a really good time. Everybody's going to be there. So May 4th, San Bernardino, May 5th, the next day in Riverside, amen. It'll be a 6 o'clock service, amen. So these are all the announcements. We're going to let the put off with So let's worship God. Hallelujah. Be faithful with your tithes, with your offerings, amen. Uh, don't forget, uh, um, if you pledge for missions, amen, missions uh, uh, will be going out this week to Colombia and Peru. Um, and if you if you pledge for the carpet, amen, uh, make sure you, you, you add it, and then we will, I believe, uh, within the next week or so, we should be able to get an appointment with the guy so he can come in and finish the carpet for us. Um, but... Uh, but allow God to bless you, amen. Be faithful with your giving, amen. Let's bow our hearts as Brother Angel bless the gift of the giver. Father well, God, we ask that you bless these tithes and these offerings that are brought before you this morning, God. And we ask that you bless those that continue to be faithful in your kingdom, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. The angels go before him and at the door. Today, today I want to talk about something that without it, without it, we'll never, we'll never make heaven our home, okay? I want to talk about something that's so important that, li that, that there's been lies laid down for this. I want to talk about something that if, if, if this doesn't exist, 
the whole the whole premise of who we are and what we do in Christianity would not exist. The whole idea of Jesus Christ would not exist. Today, what I want to talk about, amen, is forgiveness. It doesn't matter where you are in your Christian walk. It doesn't matter if you're saved, not saved. It doesn't matter if you've been serving God for a long time. It doesn't matter if you're backslidden in heart. It doesn't matter if you just gave your life to God five minutes ago. Forgiveness is something that every single human person, human being, has to deal with. Without it, amen, heaven does not exist for us. Jesus Christ, the whole premise of the, of the cross, of what Jesus Christ did for us was for the forgiveness of our trespasses. So forgiveness is always an important thing. And whenever, whenever, amen, a preacher talks about this topic, it, it really pierces the heart because it's, it's personal. Forgiveness is extremely personal. Forgiveness has nothing to do with the person next to you. And it's solely all upon you. Forgiveness starts with yourself. It cannot start with the person that you're mad at. It cannot start with the people who come against you. It cannot start with any of that. Forgiveness has to start within. That's the way forgiveness works. I heard it said that heaven, heaven is not full of perfect people. You understand that? Heaven's not full of perfect people. Heaven is full of forgiven people. Understand this. Heaven is populated by people who have been forgiven. Not by people who are perfect. The Bible tells us that no one's perfect. Bible, matter of fact, the Bible even states, no one is perfect, no, not one. Right? The only one that's perfect is our Father, which is in heaven. So we're not perfect. So the premise of us trying to be perfect people is, is unattainable. Does it mean we, we, we don't try to work towards perfection? No, we do. Does it mean that we don't try to live as clean as we possibly can? Of course we do. But we can't beat ourselves up on our imperfections. But what we can do is begin to understand that without forgiveness, we may fall short of the kingdom of heaven. Because without forgiveness, without what Jesus Christ did for us, heaven could not be possible. We became a Christian because of forgiveness. In John 15, 13, it says, it says, John 15, 13, it says, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. There's no greater love than to lay your own life down for a friend. See, there are many areas in life where forgiveness is needed. Many areas where it's necessary. But sometimes we think forgiveness is impossible. I may think it's, it's, it's impossible to forgive certain people. This is really, this is. And, 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 and throughout the sermon, I'll share personal things in my own life where there's been times where I've had hatred for people so much. How could I not hate them? How could I not? I had every, I had every logical reason to hate a person. To never discuss a word, to never talk to them again, never to, to wish hateful things upon them. Every thought in my mind, I, I, could, I could turn around and justify it by actions created by that person. Or this person, or that person. Because there's been multiple people in my life. And we deal with that as, as we live for God. Hatred is so real that sometimes it consumes our thought process. We'll hear a name that reminds us of the name of the person that we don't like. We hear of a, we hear of a, a song that triggers a memory of, of a situation that transpired, that created a hatred that, that, is, that is burning within us. The famous saying for for, uh, for for unforgiveness is like is like taking some poison and drinking it and hoping someone else is going to die. It's not going to happen. That forgiveness of that poison, you drink it and it kills us. It destroys who we are. 
It removes, amen, the very thing that Jesus Christ did for us. Most of the time when we think of forgiveness, it has to do with us forgiving someone else for something we feel was hurtful. And we, and, and, and we hold it in. We hold in that kind of forgiveness because the hurt of the ones we need to forgive, it turns into hatred. Now, hatred, it's an emotion that when it enters into your heart, it will begin to take over your life. Understand this. You can be mad at somebody, but you don't hate them yet. You're just mad at them. Right? I love them. Just don't like them right now. But if we don't take care of that, that emotion, that anger can turn into hatred. And begin to fester within us, bubble up within our hearts, begin to take over our thoughts. And once hatred begins to settle in, removing it becomes one of the most difficult things you may ever go through in your Christian walk. When we allow hatred, I want you to understand this, when we allow hatred into our hearts, when we allow anger to settle in, but you don't understand, they hurt the one that I love the most. They hurt my child. They hurt my parent. I can never forgive them for this. You don't understand the things that they did to me, the way they touched me, the way they looked at me. And we allow those things, that hatred, that anger, to just begin to just fester within us. But it becomes so strong that it now consumes our life. I have family members who things have transpired upon their lives that they have spent their entire lives, things that happened to them when they were children, they're now become senior citizens and this still think, this thing from their childhood still affects them mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. This is the reality of what hatred does. This is the reality of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness will consume you to the point that you cannot serve God. You understand that? You can allow hatred consume you to the point that you cannot move forward in the things of God. That it won't allow you to move in the things that God is calling you to do. That the things of God, amen, will be, will be altered, will be hindered because, because of your thought process of what, of what the person did to you. Or what you think the person did to you. Or what, they, what you may have heard that the person may have said. That that hatred settles so deep within you that you can no longer function. Do you understand that unforgiveness creates generational problems? When we, when we find it hard to forgive, it affects generation to generation. It doesn't just affect you. It can be passed down to a generation. People will hate nations because of generational curses. Because of generation. I know people, I know I, I, I know an Armenian. And he hates Turkey. Hates everything about Turkey. Why? Not Turkey that they eat the food, Turkey the country. Because of, of the genocide that Turkey tried to do to Armenia generations ago. I know Korean who don't like Japanese. Doesn't matter. Because of the way the Japanese invaded Korea. Because of the wars that took transpired generations ago. Where you get young people today who still can't stand that whole nation. And it happens here. Where there's where, where we have racial hatred where we don't like the color of their skin because of things that happened and transpired decades and generations ago. See, this stuff will settle in because we get taught and it passes down from generation to generation. You know that, that the hatred that a, that a parent has for a person, it, it reflects through their children? Because their children will now will, will respond to these people the same way. I remember my first pastor, he told me, he goes, I can always tell when parents are talking bad about the pastor. Because their kids will begin to, to, to react a certain way. 
They'll begin to hide. They'll begin to, they'll begin to look at. They'll begin to not want to talk to them because they hear mom and dad talking about the pastor. This is reality, and it will affect the next generation because who you are is what your children will be. It's the reality. Well, I've never liked this, so they don't like that either. Why do you think? Why do you think we grew up in a culture where all we listen to is this specific type of genre of music? The generationally, everybody listens to that type, specific type of genre. Why? Because we put it in our, we put it in their heads. I hear certain music and it reminds me so much of my dad. I hear a certain song that reminds me of my mom. And it's because they they embedded it into my head throughout the years. Not on purpose, but but it was just part of life. So when there's hatred or unforgiveness that sits into a person's life, it doesn't stay with them. We pass it down. It becomes a curse upon the next generation. It's almost like a family heirloom, the family heirloom of hatred. See, this kind of unforgiveness, it affects our children, it affects their lives, it affects relationships, and it is not something that sits and goes away. If it's ignored, it causes families to alienate from one another. You know, if you ignore it, before you know it, you'll be by yourself. Sometimes people will alienate themselves from another family member because of the hatred they have for another person. How dare you? How dare you talk to that person after what they did to me? And you still talk to that person? How dare you? I thought you loved me. I thought we were best cousins. I thought we were best friends. I thought you loved me. But yet you still talk to them? After what they did to me? Meanwhile, they didn't do nothing to them. Meanwhile, that person, they don't even remember. They may not even have known. And was never given the opportunity to ask, to, to, to say I'm sorry. But that unforgiveness has just been passed down. And we alienate each other from family members this way. This is what happens. <coughs> But what about the what about the forgiveness we need when it comes to the things we have done that we know are not in line with the will of God? The acts of disobedience and rebellion. Unless we get it right with God, they become the very thing that we pass down to our children. Remember the ch your children. Remember, our children know us better than we think. They know the way we serve God. They know the way we rebel against God. And they believe whatever comes out of our mouth is truth. They believe that our emotion is the right emotion. I have seen parents, amen, with anger issues. And that parent with the anger issue now has grandchildren with the same anger issues. It's reality. We constantly look for characteristics in children. Yep, just like their dad. No, just like their mom. That's what we do. We look for those characteristics because it falls down from generation to generation. Oh, they're hot-headed just like their mom was, just like their dad is, and, 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 we, and we stay with that because we know that it, 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 it falls down, but you got to understand Forgiveness is necessary to inherit the kingdom of God. Without it, we have nothing. Without it, the whole, the whole idea of the cross is gone. It's mute. The, the cross with the blood in it, the, the blood and the, the shedding of the blood on the cross, amen, that brought us forgiveness. It gave us a promise of heaven. It gave us a symbol of hope. But without forgiveness, what good is it to us? When all we can do is accept and never give. Isn't that selfish? I can accept all day. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But if I'm not giving, 
I become a selfish person. Oh God, I accept your forgiveness. Bring your forgiveness on my life. I accept you into my heart, Lord. And forgive me for everything that I've done. But God, stay away from that person because they don't deserve you. And this is the reality of the cross. We, we mute and silence the cross because we choose the emotion of our unforgiveness over the blood of Jesus Christ. And the thing is, our children will grow and become the Christians that we are. See, the things that, the things we need to be given, to be get, uh, to be forgiven for, they vary. Some of us have a lot that needs forgiveness. Some of us do. Some of us have a little. But one thing I promise, every single one of us has something. We all have something. I'm the pastor of the church. I'm the, I'm the spiritual father of this church. But I need to repent daily. God, forgive me for my disobedience. God, God I know, God, you want me to do more than what I'm doing, Lord. Forgive me, God. Forgive me, God, for putting my, my, my tiredness over my calling. Forgive me, Lord, for not putting time aside in the morning for, for prayer this morning because... Because I needed to, I needed to go and, and do this instead. I was too tired. God, God, forgive me for not getting into Your Word today, because I, I I found myself getting up late. Lord, forgive me. You know it's funny we can get up every morning and not pray because we don't have time, but yet we still have time to get a cup of coffee. How does that make sense? We can get up every morning. And not have time to pray or time to read our word, but we can get to work early. How does that make sense? We can get to work early. We could get to work on time, but be to church, but come to church late. See, it all, it all goes together. And sometimes we need that forgiveness. Because things like that, we need to forgive ourselves and begin to repent to God and say, God, let me be a new person with you. So remember, it doesn't matter the measure of forgiveness that is needed. But remember, all forgiveness is great and it is necessary. Forgiveness is something that is necessary in our Christian walk. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things in which I say? Ephesians 4.32 says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. But then Paul ends it with this, with this horrible, horrible line. Paul says in Ephesians 4.32, he says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. All right, Paul, whatever. All right. But he ends it with this last part. Even as God in Christ forgave you. Even as God in Christ forgave you. What does that mean? Even as God in Christ forgave you. You know what that means? It didn't matter what you did. It didn't matter what went on in your life. It didn't matter what, what you were doing. It didn't matter how far your heart was away from God. The Bible says as far as, far as the, the east is from the west, right? As far as the east is from the west. That's how we separate ourselves. The reason why the reason why it says east from the west, if you if, if when you look at the when you look at a, at a globe, the Bible doesn't say from the north to the south. It says from the east to the west, because on a globe it's round, right? So if you start on the north and you head south, once you get to the bottom of the south, eventually you're going to head north again. So you go south, north, but east from the west goes this way. As far as the east from the west. East and west never never meet. You never change. No matter what direction you go, east and west will never meet. North and south do. The east and west don't. But what happens, what happens 
Paul says for us to be forgive, uh, forgiven people just as God in Christ forgave us. God has separated us from our sin. As far as the east is from the west, so are our transgressions. He has separated us from our transgressions. From the very things that we need to forgive it from, God separated us. He says, you know what? I'll use my own blood to wash that away. I'm going to separate you from your transgressions. That's why Paul says when we forgive, we need to forgive in this manner. That we say, you know what, God? I forgive them. Matter of fact, I, I forgive them so much, God. I would, God, I want you to go prepare a place in your mansion for them. That you can come back and get them and take them to the place in which you've prepared. That's forgiveness. Human nature tells us we can't because you don't understand what they did to me. And you know what? I don't care if they make it to heaven. They can make it to heaven all day long, but they better not be in my neighborhood when I get there. They better be down the street because I don't ever want to see them again. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is putting it all down and saying, you know what, God? Just as you forgave me, I'm going to forgive them. I'm not going to look back at it. I'm going to let your blood wash it away that I don't see it no more. You know, I love my kids. I have three kids. And to me, my kids, my kids are Sunday school age. My kids. My kid, my mind, my oldest is 19 years old. In my mind. She's 32. With four kids. Married. But in my mind, she's still 19 years old. My kids are little. That's what my mind is. And if you, if you have older children, you know what I'm talking about. Your kids are always going to be your babies. I love my kids to death. There's nothing they can do that will ever tear me apart. My kids have hurt me. They have, they have did things. They have said things. They have allowed things that have hurt me. And some of it hasn't, and most of it hasn't been intentional. Some of it has. But no matter what, I will always lay my life down for them. Because the love I have for my kids doesn't matter who they are or what they are today. It's a matter of what my heart is with them. What matters is what I want, what I want for their lives. God, I don't care what they've turned themselves into today, but God, I'm believing that the blood of Jesus will set them free and that they will make it to the kingdom of heaven no matter what happens in their life. The world, the world, the society might not agree with them, but I don't really care what they say because I agree with you, Lord. It's your word that says that they shall be set free. Paul tells me that I need to forgive them just as Christ has forgiven me. See, forgiveness goes deep. That's the kind of forgiveness we need when it comes to other people. See, people are going to come against us all the time. People are going to hurt us. People are going to hate us. People are going to talk bad about you. People are going to accuse you of things that may never transpire. People will say, this is because of you. You did this. This happened over here because of you, your fault, your exemplarship. But the thing is, how do we respond? Because your kids will one day will grow up. And they will say things. They will hurt you. But you know what? You still love them. I love my kids. Does it mean I don't want to strangle them? Oh, no, 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 no. Believe me. They've heard, they've heard me tell them. I brought you in this world. I'll take you out. I remember. I remember. I was going to beat the heck out of my daughter one day. She said she was going to call the cops. I told, I told her she better tell them to hurry. I go, girl, I can put a lot of work in in a couple minutes. You better tell them to hurry. Matter of fact, here, use my phone. That's where they know where to get me. Just believe me, I'll make it worth it. But I love her to death. I, I love my daughter. She's a big pain in my butt most of the time. But you know why? You know why she's my, a pain in my butt? Because I love her. You know that people can't hurt you? Only people who you care about can. Yeah. Right? Only people you love can hurt you. A stranger can walk up to you and tell you something. Whatever, dude. Yeah. Not but the person you care about can come tell you the same exact things. Yeah. It will affect you for the rest of your life. It will eat you up inside. It will hurt you in ways that you can't even explain. Hate your, it, it, that, 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 that hurt begins to fester. And if you don't get rid of it, it will turn into a hatred that you cannot hold on to. 
it will destroy you. You know that sicknesses are born from hatred and that emotion. You know that stress, nerve disorders, angers, and even cancers come from this stuff? From these ulcers that develop over this stuff because we allow it to fester and sit within us? It destroys our health. You know why it destroys our health? Because it goes against the exact design of God. The design of God for a human being isn't, isn't to hold on to these things. It's the human nature, what we created in our sin, that allows us to be these kind of people. But God didn't design us this way. God didn't design us this way. What happened with, with Abel and Cain? Abel and Cain, when you got two brothers, the first family of the, of, the, of, of the world. Jealousy set in, and it bugged one of them. I'm so mad, I forget this. The other one just did what he was asked to do. Hey, let's give an offering. Okay, you give an offering, I'll give an offering. Oh, you know what the Lord said to do this. Okay, I'm going to go do that. This is the offering. He doesn't do anything wrong to his brother. But because God honored one offering, not the other, hatred set, set in. And what if one brother drew to the other? He killed him. Because he would not let it go. And don't think for a moment that, that hatred cannot turn into murder. Because it does. It does. It absolutely does. And I'm not always talking just about the physical physical death. <clears throat> so I put myself in positions before where I didn't speak to God. And just went with, well, I know what I'm supposed to do. And little by little, emotions of anger and unforgiveness begin, and even hatred begins to settle in. As Christians, we know what we need to do, right? We know, okay, they're bugging me, they get on my nerves, you know, I, I let it go, okay? But every time you hear that name, but I let it go. And they say the name, but I let it go, you know, I forgave them, I forgave them, but every time, man, they, you know what, I forgave them as long as everybody stops saying that stupid name. I forgive them. As long as nobody mentions them, right? I've forgiven them. I know what to do. I, I've already settled with God. I've settled with God. But every time somebody mess a name, they always want to bring it back. Lying devil. Hey, the lying devil. The devil ain't got that kind of power. I know what I'm supposed to do. I already went. I told God about it one time. And God said, you know what? Okay, you've forgiven them. That's it. And we walk away. But yet we still allow it to fester within us. And stop bringing it to, to the altar. Stop bringing it to God and saying, God, I took care of God, I took care of it, God. Don't worry about it. I got it. I got you, God. Don't worry about it. I don't need your help. I got this. And what happens is we allow it to continue to fester silently within us. And it begins to destroy us from the inside. And little by little, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, it begins to just build up. And we become to we begin to explode. The next generation gets to see the hatred that we've developed before they were even born. Before I became a Christian, before I gave my life to God, you know, when it came to the way other people thought about me, you know, I didn't care. I, really didn't. I don't care what they think. I don't care what they say. Matter of fact, I didn't care who liked me, didn't like me. And the people who didn't like me, I made sure I gave them a reason not to like me. Because that's the way it was. You ever did that? They don't like me. I didn't do nothing to them. But they don't want to like me. I'm going to give them a reason not to like me now. I'm going to make it worth them not liking me. We'll see who doesn't like who now. Right? You don't want to like me? All right, let's do this. Right? Am I the only one that did that? But now that I'm a Christian... I am honestly trying to maintain a good reputation and relationships. And that's tough. That's tough. That's tough. I really care what people think about me now. I really do. Because I've learned, I've learned this. What a person thinks about me may determine whether or not they may ever make it to heaven. Understand this. 
what a person thinks about you may determine whether or not they will make it to heaven. The Bible says we are the light of the world, right? The city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. So what people think about you may determine whether or not people make it to heaven. Yeah, but who cares? They don't they don't do nothing. They don't even come to my church. What do I care? <clears throat> well, with that attitude, they never will either. You're a representation of the blood of Christ that, that, that fell upon the hill of Calvary. You, you're that representation. You are the result of forgiveness according to the blood of Christ. You're the result of it. And when we have this kind of emotion, this kind of thought process, we remove the effectiveness of the blood. We remove the effectiveness of the Christ. And we, and, we, and we cause it to become silent. So it's important. This is, is an extremely important thing. John 10.10 10 says, Jesus says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The devil only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And I'm going to tell you, we, hear, we read that, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. We think the word kill means he's going to kill you physically. That's not what he's talking about. You know if the devil kills you physically, you know what he's done? He's made you a martyr. Because who you are as a Christian just became, man, to the end, to his last breath. He lived for God. No, 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 no. He wants to kill your salvation. Because he ain't looking at your physical lifespan. He's looking at your eternal lifespan. He doesn't want you to spend eternity. So when it says the devil comes to but nothing but to kill, steal, and destroy, he ain't talking about your physical physicality. He's talking about eternal life. He wants to kill you from ever in inheriting the kingdom of heaven. He wants to kill you. How is he going to do that? By reminding you of what she did to you. Reminding you of who he was when you talked to him last. Reminding them of how they how they speak to you. That's going to kill our salvation. Because we don't need to forget. You're justified in feeling the way you do. It's okay. It's okay. You know, last year, well, what were we in? 2024, 2022. In 2022, I got a call from a brother saying, he goes, hey Ben, what? He goes, I just got a call from our, from, from our cousin. He tells me her name, I'm like, he goes, he didn't even say her name. He just, I mean, he didn't say she was a cousin. He just said, he just said her name, right? Like, and he continues talking and I go, wait, wait, hold on. Who's that? What are you talking about? It was our cousin. I didn't know we had a cousin by that name. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I, I Honestly, I don't know really much of my family. Well, wait, what, what happened? He goes, he said that our dad died. Now, mind you, it's supposed to be my real father, who I have not seen since my 32-year-old daughter was an infant in a carrier. She was only a few months old. That's the last time I've seen her. In and out of prison, he did some horrible things. To, to He did some horrible things. Horrible things. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm the pastor of the family. Matter of fact, Martha's family will introduce me to people. Well, this is our family pastor. This is Pastor Ben. You know, and, and, okay. So now I'm like, okay, well, what am I going to do? I'm the only one who lives in California. Now everyone else is back east. So. He goes, well, give her a call. They need something. They needed some something signed because for the body or whatever. So I go, okay. I give her a call, introduce myself. Never talked to her a day in my life. We ended up becoming really good friends. I love her to death. She's an amazing, amazing, amazing person. However, they tell me about the about how he died, and he, he died. He died, right? I grew up hating. I mean, hating this guy. There was a time in my life that I wish I would have seen his face and killed him myself. And I'm I'm being real. I had every ability to do it. I had every resource to do it. And there was plenty of times I could have dumped that body. I didn't care. That's who I was before I gave my life to Christ. No. The last five years of his life, he cleaned up. 
he reached out to to apparently I have a sister who's older than my older sister that I didn't even know existed. I just found out too when I found out he died. He reached out to her to build a relationship. He didn't reach out to me. He didn't reach out to her. But five years ago, he gave his life to God. Five years ago, he stopped using drugs. He was a heroin addict, a lifetime heroin addict, starting when he was like 15 years old. He ended up dying in his, in his late 70s. All of his life. Take off. I go, okay, well, you know, she tells me we'll do the funeral. Blah, 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 okay, whatever. She says she's going to take care of all the arrangements and whatever. And okay, you know, whatever. You know. I'm not talking about, this is real stuff. I just went through this a couple years ago. She asks me when I'm gonna come back from Italy and tell her he'll be there from here to here to here. And she goes, okay. She said, when I, while I'm in Europe, she gives me a call and says, hey, I set the funeral for this date. It's two days after you guys come back. She goes, you don't have to say yes. And I understand if you say no. She goes, but I was wondering if you'd like to do the service. Mind you, this is a guy who abandoned me as a young child. I've seen maybe five or six times my entire life. He was abusive. Abusive. But now I'm being asked to do his funeral. Now I'm finding out he gave his life to God five years ago. What do you do? I'll tell you what I did. I said, okay. And I found good things to speak about. And I found things to talk about because when I seen that he gave his life to God, I was reminded by God that his forgiveness came from the forgiveness God gave to me because my Bible tells me, except the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your whole household shall be saved. And this was a result of that promise from God. Amen. You see, the promise of God goes deeper than your emotion and your feelings. It goes deeper than the things that you can think about. Now, the things he did were horrible. I'll say it this way. He was, he, was, he was abusive physically, right? Physically. His fist, right? And I'll let, I'll let your imagination run wild. Yeah, he was bad to little girls too. But I have to find a way to forgive that. That doesn't mean I'm in agreement with him. No, I don't agree with that at all. But does it mean I'm going to allow him and his past to keep me out of heaven? When God himself said, I forgive him? You see, hatred falls so deep that we don't know how to let it go. It falls so deep that we can't, we can't release it. Because you don't understand what people have done to me. They hurt me so much. Pastor Lorenzo is my pastor. He's the head of the fellowship. He's in El Centro, California now. He was over here in Rialto. But he wasn't my first pastor. My first pastor was another guy in Ontario. Sister Madden knows him. He was, his, he was her pastor too. This guy was my spiritual father. And I'm just sharing with you guys, okay? Because I want you to understand, I'm not talking because I read this in a book. This man was my spiritual father. Are you guys like it or not? I'm the pastor of the church. I'm your spiritual father. I'm your spiritual guide to the church. Okay? That's why the Bible says that, that it's honorable for a man to want this position, but the judgment is, is harder upon the preachers and the teachers. So it, it, it's, 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 a hard, it's a hard position to carry. People come against you. Well, this guy was my, my first pastor. He destroyed me, man. He stinking abused. He was abusive. He was abusive. He, he, he destroyed us so much. He destroyed not just my life. He did it to Madeline and Jesse. He did it to other church, other people that were coming to the church. He kicked us out of church. I was his number one disciple who was preaching every Sunday night. And for some reason, I always do the Spanish ministry. I didn't even speak any word of Spanish back then. I used to, we used to do bilingual sermons on Sunday nights, and I, was, I, used to, I used to do those sermons. I was the bass player. I was in charge of everything. One day to the next, I was out of the church without an explanation. 
it crushed me. Because, so you love your parents, right? Well, we love our parents. But when you have a spiritual leader who has invested into your life, somebody who was a stranger at one time, but now became a part of your of your breathing, who helped guide you, mind you, this, me and Martha came to God when our marriage was, was apart, we were gonna get a divorce. He helped men that together. God used his life to mend all that together. He made me, he made me a man. I always say this, my first pastor made me a man. Uh, before that, I was a street punk. He made me a man. Pastor Lorenzo made me a man of God. It was a big difference. So he made me a man. He really did. He taught me the responsibility of being a man, being a husband. It went deeper than even what I would have for a father because I just told you what happened to my father. And he crushed me. It hurt. Man, it hurt so bad. I couldn't even speak about it. I'm okay now because I've forgiven him. But I couldn't even speak about this for years, years. It kept it, matter of fact, it was so bad it kept me and Martha out of church for seven years. It affected my work, my marriage, the way I raised my kids, my walk in God, my destiny, my calling in God. It affected everything. Thank God that he called me so loud that I couldn't ignore it anymore. That I repented and came back. Because it could have cost me my eternity. And I'm going to tell you, for those seven years, I may have entered the streets of Ontario five times at most. At most. And that's where I grew up. And the reason why I didn't go is because if I seen his face, I would have stinking killed him. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that hypothetically, like you know, just an emotional. I would, I would just kill like no, I would have killed him. I would have killed him. I would have thrown my truck and buried him somewhere, because that's the kind of hatred I had towards him, and I had the resources to do it. That's who I was before I gave my life to God. Not so much I hated him. Today, it don't bother me. A matter of fact, I go to Ontario all the time now, and I drive by I drive by their house that they have over there in Ontario, hoping to see him because I want to let them know that God still loves him. But the calling of God cannot be revoked because you know what? It is something that is eternal that God has called upon a person's life and he can never take it away. Because I had to learn to forgive the guy. So when I tell you about forgiveness, I'm telling you from, the, from a place that I've been and I'm telling you that this is real stuff. Without forgiveness, we cannot make the kingdom of heaven our home. Without forgiveness, we make the cross become silent. See, the devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to kill us from ever making it to the kingdom of God. In Exodus, God speaks to Moses. Exodus 32, 33, and I'm going to close with this. Exodus 32, 33, 34. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now, there, therefore, go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Right here, God's telling Moses, says, the people who sinned against me, because remember, this is important. God tells Moses, the people who sinned against me, I'll block them. There's two things there. One is, people don't come against you. They're coming against God. If you're a child of God, they're not coming against you. They're coming against God. When somebody wants to beat up your child in school, they're not, either you take it personal, right? We take it personal. No, 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 no. You ain't touching my kid, Right? We take it personal. This is what God said. Moses, the people who have sinned against me, I'll block them out. You just go and lead them. You just go and lead them. Lead them to the promised land. The one that's flowing with milk and honey. The one in which I've already told you that we're going to take them to. God said, all I want you to do is just go lead them. 
Forget about their sin, what they've done against me. Don't forget about that, Moses. That's not for you to care about, Moses. That's not your that's not your problem. That's my problem, Moses. It is my job to determine whether I'm going to forgive them or get them into heaven or not. Your job, Moses, is just to lead them. Show them the love of God. Let them know that the love of God is real. Because you know what? There's people out there that if you were just to go and talk to them and let them know, you know what? Don't worry about that stuff. I just want to invite you to church. That act alone will get people saved by them knowing that forgiveness really does exist. See, forgiveness is something we don't play with. So forgiveness is the real thing. Forgiveness, without it, we have nothing. Amen? Amen. See, God has a calling on your life. And the calling on your life is unique to you only. Yes, there might be other people that are capable of doing something for God. But there's absolutely not a single other person on earth who can fulfill the calling God has for your life. Isn't that what the Bible says? Is my plans? So my plans are not his plans, but his plans are bigger than my plans. Right? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, for my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. For my ways are not your ways, your ways are not my ways. My ways are higher than your ways. Right? So right now, as I talk about this, there's things festering in me. How am I gonna? How am I gonna do this? How am I gonna forgive these people who just I just can't? God says, "Don't worry about that. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. They sin against me, and I'll block their name out. That's not for you to do. You just go and lead them. You lead them, and let me do the rest of the work." I like every about every eye closed just for a moment. Every about every eye closed. We're going to take time to pray. I think this is an important, important word today. Forgiveness is something. It doesn't matter who you are. This is something that that really, that really, really sits within us all. It's something that. That that we we struggle with. I struggle. I I've dealt with people who who didn't have a problem forgiving other people, but they had a bigger problem forgiving themselves for the things that they've done. I run into so many people that says, "Well, I go to church, but God can never forgive a person like me." Let me tell you, God can forgive you, man. God has a plan for you. God is going to do something great in your life. So real quick, if you're here and you're not saved, or right now you find your heart far away from God, and you'd like to accept Jesus Christ, you'd like to repent, you want to say, God, you know what, I want to, I want to, I want to rededicate my life to you, I want to, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put everything down, God. If that's you, and you'd like to accept Jesus Christ, could you just raise your hand? And one more time in this place, you're here, and you'd like to accept Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, can you just raise your hand? Okay, I might change your order of service. Forgiveness starts at the altar. It starts. It starts at the altar. Without without coming to the altar, how can we say, God, I've given it to you? Without laying it down and saying, God, I give it to you, how can we expect to move forward? So we're going to stand. And we're going to sing this song. But I want to take this time. If God spoke to you, I want you to find a come, come up front. I want you to find a place to pray. And if we're honest with ourselves, each and every one of us need to.